straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. A deadly shooting at the hands of Hollywood star Alec Baldwin. We have recovered what we believe to be possible additional live rounds on set. Who officials say could be charged in the death of a cinematographer and a lengthy jury selection in the trial for the death of Ahmaud Arbery. I don't expect a revolt, but I do expect that we're going to have to continually thank these jurors and remind them of how valuable their service is to us. Law and Crime Daily brings you the latest developments live from Georgia. Plus, a famed TikTok star turned infamous, Ali Abu Laban pleads not guilty to his wife's murder after using his daughter's iPad to spy on her mother. And later, just kept seeing a friend of mine for 20 years that was gunned down on her back. Hear why the lead detective in the Markeith Lloyd case says he has Jesse Weber in for Brian Buckmeyer, who's in Georgia covering the Ahmad Arbery trial. Also with me, of course, is co-host Terry Austin. New details come to light about the fatal shooting of a cinematographer on a movie set in New Mexico. Long Crimes and Jeanette Levy's here with what the sheriff and district attorney are saying, along with details from a new search warrant. Jesse, both the sheriff and the district attorney of Santa Fe County say it's just far too early to determine whether or not criminal charges will be filed against anyone in this case. But the sheriff said during a press conference that there was live ammunition on the set, one of those rounds killing cinematographer, cinematographer Helena Hutchins. I want to ensure the victims, their families, and the public that we are conducting a thorough and objective investigation. Sheriff Adan Mendoza on the fatal shooting of Helena Hutchins on the set of Rust last Thursday. Mendoza says investigators recovered the 45 caliber Colt revolver actor Alec Baldwin fired during rehearsal, along with two other guns, one plastic. The gun had been given to Baldwin by Rust's assistant director, Dave Halls, according to a search warrant affidavit. An armorer named Hannah Gutierrez was in charge of the weapons. All three individuals have been cooperative in the investigation and have provided statements. The sheriff says 500 rounds were recovered from the set, some dummies, some blanks, and some live ammunition. We suspect that there was other live rounds that were found on the set. I won't comment further on how they got there. That's still part of a, a this, this investigation is active, so I won't comment on how they got there. Helena Hutchins died. Director Joel Souza was wounded. But will anyone face charges? The sheriff and the DA say it's too early to tell. If the facts and evidence and law support charges, then I will initiate prosecution at that time. You never sacrifice safety for convenience. Bobby Chacon is a former FBI agent who works on television shows as an advisor. An affidavit for a third search warrant reveals armorer Hannah Gutierrez told investigators live ammo is never kept on the set. Gutierrez also told investigators she handed the gun to both Alec Baldwin that day and Dave Halls. The affidavit says Halls told investigators he could only see three rounds in the gun before continuing rehearsal and said he should have checked all of them but didn't and couldn't recall whether Hannah spun the drum of the revolver to make sure it was clear. So you always do a double check. You, you, everybody checks it, everybody that's handling that weapon always checks it, should always check it. And that's how you avoid, you know, saying, oh, well, somebody else told me that. Now, a report by The Wrap uh, reported that there were actually members of the film crew doing uh, target practice during the lunch break. It's called plinking. They were shooting at beer cans. They call it plinking because of the sound that it makes when the bullet hits the beer can. Sheriff Mendoza was actually asked about that during the press conference, and he said he could not comment on where the live ammunition came from since this is an active and ongoing investigation. Jesse? All right, let's talk about it. We're joined now by co-host Terry Austin and also legal analyst Dina Dahl. Dina, let me start with you. The Santa Fe County District Attorney says that no charges are off the table in this case, but what is the likelihood that Alec Baldwin himself could face charges, not only as the person who fired the weapon, but he was a producer on the movie, maybe meaning he had added responsibility? It's a unique situation, and that the person who fired the gun, Alec, is 
most likely least going to be culpable for any criminal charges because it would have been reasonable for him to have relied on the announcement of cold gun. That's typical for actors. And for it to be a criminal charge, he would have had to act recklessly. But as a producer, the producers could very well be found to have been unreasonable in their actions, which would result in civil liability. Whether or not the producers acted recklessly, I mean, it's far too soon to tell on that situation. Terry, there was at least one report that said Russ producers had hired a law firm to also investigate the incident. What do you think about that? I think it means they're taking this case very seriously. They hired the law firm of Jenner and Block. It's a Chicago-based firm with over 500 lawyers. They've been around since 1914, and they're investigating the shooting. Also, OSHA, which is the Occupational Health and Safety Administration, is on the site, and they are also investigating. And so the producers basically sent a memo to the entire cast saying, listen, OSHA is on site. You must preserve all evidence, and that actually includes right. emails. Yeah, and maybe they're getting ahead of a lawsuit. Uh, and Jeanette, what did the sheriff say about the round that killed Hutchins? Well, as I mentioned earlier, it was a live round. He confirmed that today, and that was the suspicion all along. Uh, but he also said that they recovered that from the shoulder of director Joel Souza. He was wounded in the shooting. So he said they were actually able to recover uh, the bullet and the, the shell casing as well. And those items have been sent to the FBI lab in Quantico, Virginia, for analysis. Yeah, well, with multiple people looking into this, we're probably going to have more answers moving forward. Thanks so much, Anjanette. Appreciate it. Switch, uh, switching gears now to South Carolina, where multiple lawsuits claim that controversial attorney Alec Murdoch may be hiding millions of dollars. In three separate civil lawsuits, attorneys say they fear Murdoch may be relocating his money after he made remaining son Buster responsible for his financial affairs. Two of the lawsuits stem from the family of Mallory Beach, who was killed in a boating crash in 2019. Murdoch's now deceased son, Paul, was charged for driving drunk and recklessly. The other lawsuit was filed by the family of Gloria Satterfeld, the Murdoch housekeeper who died at the family's home in 2018. Alec Murdoch is charged with illegally obtaining nearly $3 million worth of insurance settlements that were meant for Satterfeld's estate. All this, just the latest twist in the so-called Murdoch murder mystery. In June, Murdoch's wife Maggie and son Paul were found dead on their family property. Now, Bert Murdoch has been named a person of interest in the case, but no charges have been filed. In September, Murdoch claimed that he was shot in the head while changing a flat tire, but he later revealed it was all part of a botched suicide by hire plan meant to leave remaining son Buster with an insurance payout. Right now, Murdoch is being held in a South Carolina jail without bond. And still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, a famous TikToker pleads not guilty after prosecutors say he shot and killed his influencer wife before picking up their daughter from school. But first, jury selection in the trial for the death of Ahmad Arbery stretches into another day. Law and Crime Daily's Brian Buckmeyer is live in Georgia with the latest in the case. It was the video that shocked the nation. An unarmed black jogger, 25-year-old Ahmaud Aubrey, gunned down in broad daylight. We are gonna make sure that we find justice in this case. The three men charged will now stand trial. I told him stop, stop, stop till he hit me. I had nothing to do. I could, there's nothing else I can do. Wait, you're a passerby coming through? Nah, not necessarily. That's my son that, that shot him. I, I was in the back of the truck. Starting October 18th, watch live gavel to gavel coverage on the Law & Crime Network. And welcome back, everybody. A week and a half into jury selection, and some are expressing concern at the lengthy process in the death of Ahmad Arbery trial. Three men face charges including malice murder, felony murder, and aggravated assault in the shooting of 25-year-old Ahmad Arbery. 
Prosecutors say that Arbery was jogging near his Brunswick, Georgia neighborhood in February 2020 when he was tailed by father and son Gregory and Travis McMichael. Travis McMichael opened fire and killed Arbery, now claiming self-defense. William Roddy Bryan followed along in his own vehicle, recording the incident on his cell phone. Jury selection began for all three men last Monday in Glynn County, Georgia, and that is where Brian Buckmeyer joins us now live. And Brian, it's good to see you. You spoke with Travis McMichael's attorney earlier this afternoon about that lengthy jury selection process, correct? I did. I spoke to him about the lengthy jury selection process and also some of the words shared by some of his co-counsel saying that this process seems to be going along in a very kind of arduous and long way that he felt and was worried that there may be, in his words, a revolt where some of these uh, off, uh, some of these uh, individuals may not actually come back to court. But before we get to that part, I want to talk about how we started this morning with 36 of 64 of those prospective jurors, 19 prospective jurors came in today. We found out that five were African American. Uh, of those, three were women and two were men. Found out earlier, just before we got on, actually, that we have six now prospective jurors that are joining. So adding to that 36, we're at 42 now, getting closer and closer to that 64. Now, Wamsi's trying to move things forward, but as I said earlier about this, the defense shared concerns about a revolt or concerns of the length of the process could cause a loss of jurors in this case. So jury service is not just about sitting in the trial of the case. It's also about coming to court. It's about waiting around. It's about waiting to see if you get picked. And there's a lot of that that's happening in this case. And it's happening because of the coverage of this case and the time that we have to take with the jurors who are sitting right in front of us during jury selection. And so I'm sure that there are people waiting who feel like they have other things they need to be doing, that they want to be doing, that they're concerned or worried about, but we're still asking that they be patient with us, that if it was their son or father, that if it was their relative or family member that was on trial, like the McMichaels are in this case, that they would hope for jurors who would be patient and understanding. Brian, do you get the sense that as this trial progresses, once a jury is selected, that we might lose jurors based on everything that's going on in the courthouse and outside of the courthouse? I would hope not, Jesse. And, and the reason why I say that, um in other cases, yes, maybe, but the way that the judge in this case, as well as all the attorneys, are really trudging through all of these prospective um, jurors really gives me some bit of confidence that there may not be problems down the road. They're letting people who have any kind of issues, whether it be child care issues, health care issues, traveling issues, to get off the case, and they're really trying to drill down to that 12 and 4 alternates that can carry this case. Well, let's get into that. From your perspective, you're in Georgia. Do you think that jury selection could be wrapped up by the end of the week or will it be extended into another week and we'll have to wait even longer for opening statements so like i said earlier we started with 36 today six more just got added as i was actually speaking with you jesse so we're at 42 of that uh 64 but we're seeing jurors added four six seven a day and so if we're just kind of guesstimating based on those average numbers I think we more likely than not could be pulling ourselves into next week uh, where we can have jury selection into Monday or Tuesday because we still have to whittle down from that 64 that we're not at yet down to 12 jurors and four alternates. With those preemptory strikes, I am sure there will be a battle in the courtroom about that and it will not be so easy. But we will wait and see. And we're going to hear more from Brian Buckmeyer, who's reporting live. Brian, thank you so much. Appreciate it. On to federal court right now, where a third juror is dismissed in the fraud trial of former Theranos CEO Elizabeth Holmes. This now raising concerns as the trial is expected to continue into December. The trial began in early September, and just days later, the first juror was dismissed due to financial hardship and work schedule. Then weeks later, a second juror was dismissed after anxiety surrounding a religious belief. Then you go to last Friday, a third juror was dismissed after another juror reported that they were playing a Sudoku puzzle during testimony. Now in all, 12 jurors were selected with just five alternates. Holmes is charged with 12 counts of fraud for her work at the now defunct Theranos. She claimed that the company and its devices would revolutionize blood testing, but later tests found that there were many problems with the equipment. 
Coming up on Law and Crime Daily, the state of Florida versus Markeith Lloyd. Jurors hear from the lead detective on the case. Plus, a TikToker with nearly 1 million followers now behind bars without bail. What prosecutors say led up to the double murder. Welcome back, everybody. A TikTok star is charged with the murder of his wife and her friend in their San Diego apartment. Ali Abu Laban is mostly known for his comedy skits on TikTok, where he's known as Gin Kid. There, he's famous for his impersonations of Tony Montana from Scarface. But investigators say Abu Laban was living at a hotel after his wife kicked him out of their apartment on October 18th. On Thursday, while his wife wasn't home, the TikToker allegedly snuck back into their apartment, trashed the place, and installed a listening app, in their, uh, app on their five-year-old daughter's iPad. Investigators say that he was operating under the assumption that his wife was cheating on him. While listening to the device, Abu Laban heard a man's voice, got angry, and rushed back to the apartment. That's where he allegedly shot 29-year-old Kadinas Barron three times and then shot his wife, Anna Abu Laban, in the head. After that, investigators say he picked up his daughter from school while he was still carrying the murder weapon. He allegedly called his mother and the police and confessed to the shooting. The TikTok star has pled not guilty to the two counts of first-degree murder and remains behind bars with no bail. So, Terry, this case seems, you know, fairly straightforward. What kind of defense could he assert? Well, we're in California, and he could be charged with voluntary manslaughter, which would give him the defense that he was acting in a heat of passion, that he had this strong, sudden impulse. And that's very common when you have someone who thinks that they are being cheated on. It means basically that there was no malice aforethought, meaning that he wasn't planning this. But it's still a felony, Jesse, and he could get 11 years for each of the counts. The other defense, I think he could claim insanity, but there he'd have to show, did he know the difference between right and wrong? Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting case for sure. Well, Dina, authorities say Abu Laban confessed to his mother and police after the murders, but ended that not guilty plea. You know, how do you fight against those confessions? I feel like they're going to sway a verdict in this case if it goes to a jury. Absolutely. It's going to be one of the largest pieces of evidence because they can't even really claim that somehow it was co coerced because he voluntarily confessed to both of them. You know, hopefully this case also highlights that despite your fame, despite your economics, despite what you look like, domestic violence is real. He has a history of domestic violence So, but against her. So between that and the confessions, they have a very strong case against him. I guess the other way of looking at it was given so high profile it does shed a light on maybe those issues that don't always get the most attention. We're going to continue to follow that one. When we come back, the second murder trial for defendant Markeith Lloyd. Hear from the lead detective who testifies about his emotional interrogation of the defendant. We'll be back. Welcome back. Testimony continues in Florida for the man accused of shooting and killing Lieutenant Deborah Clayton. Clayton was gunned down outside of a Walmart while she was pursuing defendant Markeith Lloyd in January 2017. At the time, Lloyd was running from authorities after killing his pregnant ex-girlfriend, Sade Dixon. In 2019, Lloyd was found guilty of Dixon mur Dixon's murder and was sentenced to life in prison, dodging the death penalty. However, if convicted in this case, Lloyd will face the death penalty again. On Tuesday, the lead detective took the stand to talk about his investigation. On direct examination, he was questioned about his emotions while he interrogated the defendant. Tell Mr. Lloyd that he, quote, led a gutless life. I did. And did you tell him, apologize for language, Your Honor, did you call him a, a b in body armor? I did. You called him a punk? I did. And a, quote, little I did. And you said that he didn't deserve the respect of any rabid dog on the street. Did you say that to him? I did. It's extremely unprofessional for me to say that. And to this day, four years later, I beat myself out constantly as to, you know, why I allowed that to come out. Just kept seeing a friend of mine for 20 years that was gunned down on her back. And it triggered something in me that I'd just never experienced before. 
And again, I don't want it to make, sound like an excuse, but uh, that's, my thoughts came out of my mouth and they shouldn't have. Dina, we just heard some pretty damning testimony from the lead detective in the case. The question is, do you think the jury's going to care? I mean, does this help in any way Lloyd's case that he had a delusional belief that the officers were out to kill him if you hear this animosity? It certainly helps. I mean, that's one of the few things he is arguing, that there was a, this excessive police force, that as a black man, he was being targeted. And this does lead into it, those types of statements. But I believe that his apology came across very sincere and sympathetic. As he said, this police officer was gunned down and, and she was a friend. And when you see the video surveillance and really the facts of the case, you know, I don't think that that defense of um, excessive police force is legitimate in this case. Well, it is interesting that the, the prosecution who was questioning him kind of got out in front of it. They didn't hide this. It's not as if the defense just jumped in and said, didn't you say this? No, they got in front of it. Now, Terry, let me ask you this about the defense. They have spent a considerable amount of time trying to show that the that Clayton was the first to fire, that she was the aggressor. Again, going into this narrative that she wanted to kill Lloyd. You think it's being effective? Because we're almost, mostly hearing under cross-examination. I don't think that's effective at all. I think the ballistics is going to show something different. And what difference does it make? We know for a fact that Clayton was out there searching for a killer. And we know that she also said to get down, don't shoot. And we know that Lloyd actually shot her four different times. He had three shots that were not deadly, and then he went back over to shoot her to do the death shot, essentially. So I think the fact that the defense is spending time on who shot first and Clayton was shooting at him is irrelevant, and I think the jury is going to see straight through that. Well, the insanity defense is always interesting to hear, and let alone in this case. Dina Dahl, Terry Austin, thank you so much. Everyone out there, thanks for joining us here on Long Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.